So uh, today we're talking about international institutions and the question of where they're going. And it couldn't be a better topic, the international system as we have known it that was built largely post-World War II uh, and that has, uh, we, and has been added on, if you wish, over time and which now governs our lives in a way that we are completely invisible to us. The fact that we can talk on phones across the world, we can make financial payments, that we do not have to worry about uh, security, that our airplanes can fly across borders and so on. All of these are built on a whole network of international agreements, treaties, and in many cases, organizations which lie behind them. Uh, a simple thing, as we can see during the pandemic, a simple thing like a vaccine. Vaccines, which are otherwise remarkably uncontroversial, uh, depend on international standards and protocols set and agreed upon within the World Health Organization, then cleared and accepted by uh, domestic uh, regulatory systems across the world. And right now, curiously enough, as the battle over the COVID pandemic continues, uh, the world understanding on uh, vaccines is breaking down. Countries are actually saying, if we will develop our own vaccine, we will prioritize our people before everybody else. Correct. Uh, mm -hmm. And there is now a massive scramble to try and secure the European Union, try to set up a global alliance. It fell apart even within the European Union. Uh, the WHO has absolutely no control over most of the vaccine programs. The Chinese have a vaccine program in which they refuse to allow any international partner. But that's just a simple example of a purely humanitarian, non-controversial issue that has now fallen apart because the international system is no longer able to handle this in a way that was. What can India do, given that we are a, quote, middle power? There has been talk, particularly from countries like Germany, that if America and China are either undermining or unwilling to invest in the international system that they in many ways have helped sustain, can the middle powers, India, Germany, Japan, Brazil, Indonesia, so on, uh, are we in a position to play a role? So I have with us today um, Lieutenant General Sudhir Sharma from Midcat Strategic Advisory. I have Harjiv Singh, uh, CEO of Gutenberg.com, Rajiv Raghunath, CE, CEO of Wellburst Media, uh, Yogesh Singh, a partner from Trilegal, and Govind Sovale from the Indo-Swiss Center, uh, who is speaking in, for coming, uh, talking to us from Zero, to discuss these issues. Uh, and I propose that each of us speak for a few minutes uh, in the introductory, give your broad comments about how you see the international situation. Um, and then after that, in the second round, we will then discuss what in thematic issues, specific areas that many of you are specialists in, uh, and a discussion of what India, you can see India doing. So let me begin <coughs> with Lieutenant General Sharma. Uh, first of all, thank you, Pramit, for letting me um, open the batting. Uh, delighted to be on this Vrasa's uh, forum. My first time online, I'm very excited about it, being on the ground a number of years. Uh, I feel uh, personally that the international organizations are not been, uh, doing what they're supposed to do. So let me go into the root cause of the problem or the fragility and lackluster of performance of the international organization. It is indeed ironic to me that in the 75th year of the uh, forming of the United Nations, uh, the most uh, potent and the visible face, the United Nations Security Council, had been so silent on this uh, biggest crisis which has faced this since its inception. I think the complete radio silence is because of the deep divide inside the institution itself. The fact is that international organizations were created post the world war by victor nations and they do not today represent the ground realities or the geopolitics of the new world order. And therefore, they fail to address the main problems the world is facing today. For too long, I think the balance of power, decision making, and even sectarian support has rested with Western powers, some dominant powers, and some very rich Nordic countries, Ireland, New Zealand, they've been overrepresented, and therefore the rest of the world, especially like places like India, have failed to get the voice heard properly or the communication, like you said, uh, fully where they should be doing so. There have been some changes, but I think most changes have been very cosmetic in nature. They've papered over some of the differences, trying to do some new changes, but 
the systemic change is required to look forward to dealing with the new world order and the new century where problems are going to be difficult was actually kept in abeyance. I think because of the lot of self interest of this uh, founding people. Why is it that after 25 years the WTO has not been able to solve any of the world trade problems? Why is there no forum on terrorism or on cyber security because they feel very weak? So I think that you know while there was a need for empowering, distributing, and you know becoming the international organization, uh, they have failed to do so. In fact, dichotomy is that we are moving in the opposite direction. Thomas Friedman talked about the world which is flat. We are hurtling towards deglobalization, decoupling, and hypernationalism is rushing in to fill the void created by the absence of these powers. And there is a lot of a drift uh, leadership taking place because of which international institutions have become. Must be weaker. So my first premise is that we need to redesign, reshape, and reimagine international organizations. If you are to face the future pandemics, the cyber threats, the global threats, or the climate threats, else we'll again be fronting the way the WHO this time has been done because we did not prepare or be ready to deal with them. That's my opinion. Okay, can I have, uh, uh, let's see, uh, let's go on, on the basis of the screens. Can I have Rajiv? Uh, would you like to go next? And Rajiv, sure. after that? Sure. Okay. Thank you so much, Pramit. A pleasure to be here. Uh, well, talking about the strengthening of the international organizations, I would refer to the UN, former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, when he said that the challenges of the 21st century, if they were to be addressed, it would be addressed to the international organizations. Having said that, I think the role of the international organizations in preserving the international peace and security across the economic, political, and social spectra, that will continue. But what is equally important is that these organizations need to be reorganized and aligned with the real needs of the emerging world. And that, think that is a big, very big missing factor. When we talk about the strengthening of the international organization, that should not be the end goal. The end goal should be actually seeing the beneficial impact on all the member states. So the international organizations function as mechanisms for building the cooperation, also strengthening the case of individual members, which is not the case right now, where it seems like uh, some of the uh, powerful states seem to be benefiting from these international organizations. If you look at the relevancy of the international organizations, well, more than ever today, we can see that these organizations become very relevant because a lot of the issues cannot be contained or cannot be addressed within national boundaries. Uh, there's already a reference to the pandemics and how that needs to be tackled at the international level and not uh, country specific. Added to that, I would say that issues like uh, global warming and uh, the need for sustainable development, that's a global issue. We have the governance of global commons, for instance, the use of outer space, high seas, polar regions, all of these require international and multilateral action rather than individual country specific things. We would also look at the cyber attacks. I was like astonished to see this uh, figure saying that the impact of uh, cyber attacks is seen to be the order of $6 trillion by the year 2021 increase from from $3 trillion by, from 2015. So these impacts are across the entire development spectrum and they need real serious tackling. Add to that, of course, the issue of terrorism. Broadly, on the other issues are with regard to trade liberalization, which of course is going to be looked at, promoting entrepreneurship and self-employment, food security, healthcare, education, green technology. So if you look at a whole bunch of issues, they need to be tackled at the multilateral level rather than individual organizations. The last part, of course, is that you know the Washington consensus was the basis for the international organizations to approach the development uh, agenda. But today we feel that these organizations really need to reorganize themselves to address the true needs of an inclusive world. These are my initial observations. Thank you. Arjeev. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Pramit, thank you for uh, setting this up. Um, so I, I think uh, everybody uh, on, on the panel uh, at least sort of addressed some of the uh, big concerns that we have with multilateral institutions today. Uh, I just want to take a, a little bit of a different uh, tack on, on the fact that they've worked rather well since the uh, late 40s after the end of World War II uh, and have given us an architecture that allowed uh, the world to actually come together. You know, we, we tried this post-World War I uh, with sort of the League of Nations and it didn't work really well. Uh, but But relative to that period of uh, the interwar years between uh, the end of World War I and World War II, uh, the last 75 or so years have actually been 
uh, managed fairly well with the architecture that was created. It does not mean that we don't need to change it. Clearly, I, I agree with the other panelists that we need to look at some of the newer issues. Uh, but more importantly, uh, a very important part of the voice of the rest of the world uh, from the original sort of five, uh, where there was the Security Council members, uh, which also tended to be sort of the richer nations outside of China when, when it first started. Uh, but today, uh, the dynamic of the world has, has changed so dramatically uh, in terms of, you know, economic power moving to uh, Asia, uh, a huge challenge with the pandemic. You know, we will go into a, a major economic decline across the world. I think every economist understands uh, what is the consequent impact of that? Because uh, inequality is going to rise. There's going to be multiple issues that crop up. Uh, and I think it's important for us to not throw uh, the baby out with the bathwater. There, there, there are clearly challenges with the way these institutions uh, have voices reflected uh, of around the world, right? You know, Brazil is not on, uh, on in the UN Security Council, neither is India, uh, neither is Germany or Japan. And, and these are important voices and contributors to, to the UN system uh, and, and uh, in many other ways as well. Uh, and so I think my, my key takeaway is, let's look at what worked uh, from, from the last 75 years, uh, but also let's look at what we can build out of this, which is going to be uh, interesting for the next 50, 75 years, because uh, the world has changed a lot. And I think we need to transform these multi multilateral institutions to be able to address uh, issues like cyber terrorism, uh, uh, issues like, uh, you know, uh, how uh, inequality could potentially have a major impact or climate change, uh, which while we've had multiple conversations, I think, uh, and that's an area I would sort of in my subsequent comments uh, spend a little time on as well. Thank, Thank you. So, uh, Govind, would you be? Yeah, sure. So, as uh, Rajiv and uh, others have uh, said, impact has been one of the issues, right, with the international institutions, organizations right now. And if you look at what has happened uh, and where we are today, uh, we can ask ourselves where, whether these are the bodies which are actually capable of making decisions and more so uh, actually uh, actioning those decisions and causing an impact. And uh, so that's one area people have spoken about it. So I'll not take uh, more time on that. But second aspect also needs to be seen apart from strengthening these international institutions. How do we strengthen India's <laughs> position in these international organizations? Because we are we are representing one sixth of the world population. There are similar countries, as you said, uh, are our interests being properly covered and what can we do actually to make sure that our viewpoint, our interests are heard in this at various levels in these international organizations. So decision making, actioning is one part, but there are other things which are happening. I'll go to it maybe in the second round when we sp and speak more about it. But uh, can, and as uh, one of the fellow members uh, had quoted the international diplomat saying that if you don't have money, we have to bring ideas to the forum. So one, one such example was uh, the International Day Yoga Day that was proposed on the UN platform. And you can see how, how it has uh, caught up everywhere in the world. I mean, in Switzerland alone, I saw that uh, it was it's such a small country. It was celebrated at 300 places. And maybe five or six were promoted by government of India. Everything was on. -on. So it was an idea we, we, we waiting to be uh, waiting to happen. <laughs> Can we work also in, on the soft power related ideas using these forums and how that can be strengthened? I think that is also a question to panelists when we discuss. Maybe people can deliberate more, more on that. So this second aspect of uh, India's presence in these international organizations need to be uh, uh, discussed. Thanks. Thank you. So, Yogesh? So I think, um, I think everybody has been talking about the relevance um, of the international institutions, what their role is, what they should be doing. And let me just call out two key principles which lie behind the conversation. One is of legitimacy, and the second is of accountability. Uh, legitimacy can need not just be normative, whether they have the right to describe a rule, but it's more sociological, where, which is where I think the balance has been lost because a lot of the institutions are widely no longer believed to have the right to describe something because they are appealing to state factors more than the real stakeholders in terms of the people, uh, civil society. 
And perhaps if you look at the reasons for that, and it's important to address those reasons as part of this conversation, is that the international organizations themselves have had to play slightly different roles. Uh, in some situations, they have probably unknowingly, unwittingly found themselves playing the same role as which is as influential as any other state. Uh, they have had to adopt the transformation of the international society. Uh, the roles, the activities for which they had been created, formed, uh, those roles are no longer the only expectations of them. And they've had to push the boundaries in terms of what they can or cannot do. Uh, they have had real direct influence on private parties. Uh, you can look at situations like Iraq and other uh, places. So it has had a big unilateral impact of decisions made. Uh, we have to look at the, that viewpoint, uh, that how, what is that impact that is being made and why should that not be questioned? So in, how do we come up with the right legitimacy for these institutions to continue to be relevant? And second part is on accountability. I think participation of people, there are barriers to participation, which exist both in terms of formal rights of representation as well as in informal ways. Uh, who sits on the World Bank's executive board and what is done and whether this should be, why should somebody else not be more, uh, more involved? There's been conversations about discursive democracy. Uh, there has clearly been lack of transparency. Uh, no one needs to go beyond January and February and the way that WHO was endorsing everything that the Chinese state had to say. Uh, and gone from there. And I think the two other factors on accountability have been evaluation. What? How do we evaluate those? And I think that's the big challenge. And I think the last one is uh, complaints and redressal. And in the course of all this, when we evaluate these factors, I think that is where uh, a newer role has to be played by states such as uh, India. Pramit, and we just chatted before this uh, you know, before the panel started and uh, we were talking about India, can India afford to just criticize and sit on the side? Maybe the bottom has fallen out of the WHO. No, we have to actually be involved. We cannot be looking at things and asking, is the cake worth the candle? No, the effort should not be there. We have to have a very robust strategy. We have to look at trade to the points that uh, the other panelist members have, uh, panel members have already highlighted and come up with a very clear strategy and actually not let this opportunity go because this, if this is not going to come back. And we are at a very good position to actually make use of it. Excellent. That's a brilliant segue into our next round where I'll ask uh, each of the speakers to choose a theme, if you wish, and drill deeper into it and really ask ourselves, what can India do? Uh, to those who have logged in, may I remind you that you click on the chat section, uh, uh, the, ch uh, the chat uh, logo, uh, if you have any questions, and please send them. I see a couple have already arrived, uh, and we will answer them uh, after we finish this next round. So, General Sharma, I believe uh, you, security um, is one of the big public goods that are now, should we say, in danger. Pramit, I would like to say that, you know, hearing all the uh, panelists, uh, one thing is again established that the relevance of multilateral organizations is not being uh, in question at all. Everybody's looking at them and feeling that they need to be just reshaped because they are usually very important. In fact, much more important than they were in the past. And therefore, rightly so, India must grab this opportunity. And I think plunge straight into the multilateral organizations and take a leadership role in picking up the gauntlet. And the leadership is adrift at the moment, and we must provide the leadership to the multilateral organization to become part of it. If we feel that we are a growing regional power and we've got global aspirations, we talk ourselves about being the third economy in the world, then it is befitting upon us to get into the center stage and take this up head on, which means we must lead from the front. And I would like to start by saying that one of the things that where India could lead, and we've got a lot of experiences in the area of security. What we need to do is to build an entirely new security architecture, which takes place, which uh, takes into account the uh, rising role of the Indo-Pacific per se and Asia in general. So the entire region, uh, whether the Middle East, Afghanistan, South China Sea, India, the entire thing is very fragile security. And therefore, India is important for it to create a forum 
which can deal with this. And I suggest something like the multilateral alliance which France and Germany had just initiated at the end of the year. India should take a lead in creating a security paradigm of this region where it should be the leader and set up a full system how it can be done. But there are many ways of doing it, reforming the UN, United Security Council or starting an absolutely new forum where it can build up. But I think a new one based in Asia would be the ideal place to go. And I'm and along with this, we should also link up terrorism because terrorism affects India deeply. And if we can build both security and terrorism paradigm together into a security architecture of the region, I think we'll benefit a lot. And the multilateral organization can be revived and revitalized by India's presence and India's leadership. It has always been a leader in this. You know, UN peacekeeping forces, everywhere in India has played a very dominant role. In fact, it's very well respected from the security's perspective the world over. It's got one of the most professional armed forces, one of the most professional decision-making agencies. And therefore, it is right that we take the lead in this to build a security structure, brings peace and stability to the world, and our voice is heard in the world for it. That is my first point about security and terrorism. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, yes, I, I fully agree. And I think this is one of the things we're going to be addressing is until now uh, on the security side, uh, we have been essentially free riding off the United States. Uh, one of, when the MH370 Malaysian aircraft airlines airplane disappeared over the southern Indian Ocean, what was really interesting for me was not just the disappearance of the aircraft, is that traditionally anywhere in the world, in uh, maritime sphere, there is normally a U.S. warship uh, monitoring that area. And one of the reasons the MH370, there was no radar track, was that there was no American warship in the entire southern central Indian Ocean. They had all been pulled out. And I remember speaking to the Americans, and they said, we, we can't do that anymore. We're not going to do it. We've pulled out of the southern Atlantic. We've pulled out of the Indian Ocean. We've pulled out everything. Ex everything is facing China. So if you want to, India fill that space in the Indian Ocean that we're leaving behind, or somebody else, probably China, will do it for you. So Rajiv, I turn to you. Yes. Uh, when a large country like ours with a large uh, uh, population and being one of the large economies, when we back multilateralism, it means a lot for the cause of multilateralism itself, because our voice would be the voice of a lot of other nations which were similarly placed. Now, having said that, uh, and we talk about the strengthening of the international institutions, I would like to focus on two particular areas. One, of course, is education and the other is healthcare, for I believe that it is in strengthening these two sectors that the real core strengths of a, of a country could actually become stronger. Uh, when we talk about the education situ uh, situation, you know, the, the stats are very, very uh, alarming, for instance, you know, while about a billion children are going to school, uh, you know, the UNICEF itself says that almost 60 to 60, 60 to 62 percent of those children are actually facing learning difficulties owing to a variety of socioeconomic problems. Uh, along with that, of course, there are a lot of children who are caught in conflict situation areas. There are regional, uh, urban, rural disparities. There are gender disparities. So all of these things really need a serious uh, addressing. And these things need to be handled at a multilateral level. Now, what can India do in this area? I believe that we have, in a way, uh, you know, demonstrated that, you know, we can employ ICD technologies for delivering education. And today in this kind of a COVID situation, we are really seeing how the tools can be utilized for actually furthering education. So that's one area that we need to focus on. Uh, I would like to take the example of the Pan Africa e-network uh, project that was initiated by India along with the 55 uh, uh, AU nations. And that's been in a, that created a network of uh, Indian educational universities and hospitals with counterpart organizations in Africa. And I think that's gone on pretty smoothly. I think these are some of the activities that we need to broad base uh, across the globe and actually help a lot of the disadvantaged countries to also take advantage of what we can offer to them. The second point would be about building a very strong ecosystem for not only learning 
but for also training. That means that we need to have cross-border partnerships for building training for teachers and faculty programs. The third part, of course, is that we need to be promoting public-private partnership in this space, not just within the country, but also cross-border, which means that all of the countries, what are all the different policies that are governing, we need to bring that on a common platform and understand. That will have a very positive cascading effect on the whole education landscape. The last part, of course, would be the academia industry partnership. Now, again, the academia industry partnership, we often talk about it with <laughs> look at how the partnership can grow at a cross border level. That is as far as education is concerned. On the healthcare, of course, the situation is uh, no better, actually. The global disease burden is quite staggering, and I think this does not often get talked about. I looked at some of the figures of the global burden. Uh, disease uh, report and it said that in 2017 if there were 55.9 million deaths actually because of the circumstances of the death we were losing about 1.65 billion years of uh, potential life add to that uh, the issues of disability and all that we are almost lost about a third of the equivalent global population in 2017 alone and i don't think the situation has changed very much uh, one of the key problems had been that when it comes to help is the public spending is rather low. Uh, there is a need for boosting the public spending on health. Public spending on health is increasing, but only from the advanced countries. It is not increasing at a global level. Now, how do we do that? I think here, I, the multilateral financial institutions and the conditions that were set upon the borrower countries, I think that, that needs revisiting. I think such that the borrower countries are also able to spend greater uh, amount of money on public sector, uh, on public health, such that the overall health care system improves. Secondly, of course, the application of technologies is vital. I talked about ICT. ICT application in the healthcare is equally important. The Pan-Africa e-network project also delivered on that count. I think we need to take much more steps in terms of ensuring that telemedicine, uh, you know, diagnostics through mobility solutions, all of these things are are you know, taken forward to a wider uh, number of uh, beneficiaries. We need to build a global ecosystem of healthcare companies. And that's something which, uh, you know, Pramit, you said at the outset that, you know, currently we are talking about vaccine development happening, but there is really nothing happening at an international level that we can be sure that it benefits the entire world. Already, I think uh, things are beginning to happen in, in niche spaces and, you know, it's getting restricted. We need to look at that. Uh, one last point I would like to make with regard to healthcare is that we need to take these conversations to the mainstream, which means that healthcare is, seems to be like a topic that gets discussed only among the specialists. It needs to be in the mainstream, which means that that information dissemination needs to happen at a B2B level and at a B2C level as well. So these kind of platforms need to come up. And the last part, of course, is that I think we need to have a global ecosystem for uh, biotech life sciences and healthcare studies. I think these are my observations. Thank you. I mean, one of the things that we benefit, India benefits from the WHO, which a lot of people don't necessarily realize, is that they set the global standards by which our generic pharmaceuticals are sold around the world. If there were no global standards, each country would set their own, and this would be, of course, amazingly difficult uh, in, for our generics industries to work. So, Harjit, turn over to you, because I believe you will be looking at what are probably the most pressing issue of all, which is climate. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, I was going to look at it from the lens of uh, what India can do within the climate change uh, arena, because, uh, of course, uh, in addition to the pandemic, the other a big overarching challenge the world faces is about climate change. Uh, how we navigate that becomes a, a very important issue for the next hundred years. Um, and you know, the uh, last five years since the uh, Paris uh, conference in 2015, uh, there have been strides, but they just haven't uh, translated into action as much as most people would have liked. Uh, and, and I think now with the pandemic, there is going to be a huge disruption in terms of the world's attention uh, as to where they focus uh, the energies on. Uh, but having said that, I think uh, uh, if you look at what India has been able to do over the last several years, uh, one in, in partnership with France, they launched uh, the first international organization that's actually based out of uh, New Delhi in India, which is the International Solar Alliance. Um, you know, it's got 56 members, 67 members, uh, and uh, if you look at some of the recent announcements, even in the last month, uh, India has a very ambitious uh, agenda for leveraging this to not only play a geopolitical role uh, in terms of the impact this could have 
uh, and, and you know the way the ISA defines sort of the focus area is between the Tropic of Cancer and the to uh, Tropic of Capricorn. Uh, so it's a uh, very sort of uh, Africa, India, sort of Southeast Asia uh, focused uh, agenda in terms of where they look at. Uh, but they recently announced, which to me looked like the one belt, one road version of India's uh, focus on, on the one sun, one world, one grid, uh, which actually uh, was announced a few weeks ago. Uh, and, and it really is how do you make uh, energy, which is you know one of the largest sectors in the world, uh, have the ability uh, for solar uh, to be able to translate across borders. Um, and and uh, it's a pretty aggressive agenda. Uh, if you look at some of sort of the communication coming out of there, uh, I think that could be interesting. Uh, but I think for it to be uh, really worth the time and effort that India needs to put into it, it needs to be backed by not just action, but also resources. Uh, and to Pramit's point, you know, you bring ideas to the table, but oftentimes it's money that talks. And uh, in this case, India has committed about $33 million and it has uh, also sort of said that it is looking at setting up the World Solar Bank uh, with a capitalization of about $10 billion. Uh, and, and that is something also, again, which was announced, I think, just 10 days ago. Uh, and, and those are uh, announcements which will get lost within the larger news of the pandemic. Uh, but I think if we are able to push this out, there is a, a lot of opportunity. Uh, and interestingly, it ties into a very realistic sense of what our strengths and weaknesses are. You know, India is a, uh, is very reliant on importing energy for its needs. Uh, and if we are able to substitute that with one of the, the, the most important uh, available resources India has, which is a lot of sunshine, uh, I think that can have a, a, a lot of long-term positive impact on, on the uh, economy in India, but also in general in terms of what we carry uh, to the world in terms of our ideas through the ISA. Uh, so those are just, I think, some of the elements that uh, could potentially be very uh, positive. Uh, you know, India has already built uh, uh, in the last four years about 35 uh, gigawatts of uh, solar capacity. That's nearly about 10 percent of uh, total uh, energy now in India comes from renewables, with solar starting to take a larger share of that. Uh, and, you know, by 2030, the expectation is they'll go up to 300 gigawatts of uh, energy out of solar. Uh, we should, in, in, in parallel to what we are doing with the International Solar Alliance, really focus on, on developing uh, two or three areas where I think India could have additional adjacent benefits. One is uh, scientific uh, and, and technological investments into research and development, because if we don't do that, we will... Uh, we will lose out on, on the longer term benefits of this. And science is very important in this. Uh, if you look at the largest manufacturer of solar panels, it's China, uh, it's not India. So we don't have that competitive strength, but we do have the R&D competitive strength, which we should invest in uh, and then see how we can commercialize those, uh, particularly at uh, low cost uh, sort of levels, right? Because one of India's benefits is we are able to produce things at a lower cost. Uh, and if we can use that advantage over time, using our technologies that uh, that can uh, come out of our uh, investment in science, I think that could be very powerful. That's uh, what I have to say. On, on yeah, and I'll, I'll just say an anecdote on that. When the when America withdrew or announced its withdrawal from the Paris Accord, uh, there was a movement within the Indian government to join the Americans, not because they supported Trump. But simply because that if you look at the Paris Agreement, all of the promises made by the developed world to the small island nations, to the LDCs, nothing had been fulfilled. Right. So there was an argument that given that the West has totally failed to fulfill its side of the, at least uh, what was supposed to be given to Africans and the Maldives and so on of the world, uh, this was a chance for India to increase its leverage. And Prime Minister Modi actually <laughs> stepped in and he takes, soul, he takes climate change very seriously. Uh, that note, the, the destruction of the Paris Accord, uh, putting it back together would be almost impossible diplomatically, and uh, we'll have to stick with what we have and try to repair it from within. Um, uh, so the commitment there is strong, but as you said, you need not just ideas, you need the money. And the ISA, the first major international organization India has created since the non-aligned movement, um, is, is a sign of that, and hopefully it will become something stronger. So Govin, as I turn to you and are talking about trade, we have a question on trade already, so I'm going to throw that into you even before we before I let you speak. 
Uh, Professor Nilanjan Bonik from Bennett University here asks that given Brexit, given the U.S. withdrawal from the TPP, the U.S.-China trade war, the failure of the euro, the COVID bond in the European system, we're starting to see that in the world of trade and finance, the ability of countries, to, even at a plurilateral level, to function together seems to be falling apart. Uh, and instead, you're seeing nationalistic, strong, unilateral uh, leadership approaching. Where do you see the trend lines on all of this take going after this pandemic is over? What is the future of even a plurilateral trade and investment and finance globally? Over to you, Robin. Sure, thanks. I think the multilateral organizations and treaties are here to stay. Of course, you'll see. Uh, we are all seeing already a lot of friction. So I, I don't see a move, uh, action or any uh, move by any larger country to get out of uh, typical multilateral uh, agreements or organizations. But you will see a more uh, more friction. Uh, to take the control, to mend the rules, uh, bend the rules uh, in their favor, especially I think uh, from China, you will see this uh, well, more and more aggressive posture. Uh, that's that, that's the general feeling. But uh, as everybody has spoken earlier, I think nothing has changed in terms of relevance of these organizations. Right, the fundamentals are still there, and more so, though countries are turning inwards, uh, they, they are becoming dependent more and more each other. So it's 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 difficult to turn inwards. I mean, we are talking about uh, banning goods from, from certain countries. It's it's not possible anymore because uh, people are so tightly integrated. The trade trade is also so low, tightly integrated. So ultimately, you are going to have a system of rules to make all this work. Uh, so in one form or the another form, uh, this will remain. Any other panelists want also want to comment on this? Okay. I'll just turn to Yogesh. Um, okay, sorry, sorry, General Sharma, you want to make yeah. a comment? I, I was just saying to say that, you know, we talked about hyper-nationalism, we talked about hyper-economic uh, nationalism. I think once it runs its course, the pragmatic leaders of, of the country will realize that there is no substitute to multilateral organizations because we all agree that, you know, all challenges in the future are going to be transnational and trans domain and they cascade towards each other, they impact each other. So countries like India, which are so fragile because of the demography, the way they are spread out, they realize that only uh, nationalism and, you know, this hyper-nationalism and national state cannot survive till the whole world is together. So therefore, I think over a period of time, we will go back to multilateral organization, revisit them, and possibly they can revitalize and the, the wake up call that we all got the world and in the country that this is what is happening. I think we'll bring the leaders together to rethink and redesign and refashion. And I think we'll start going back, not normal, but a new paradigm will emerge in multilateral organizations still being the center of it. Of what we do. I think I got just add before I turn to Yogesh that if you look at the history of countries. The United States was one of the most fiercely isolationist countries in the world. Woodrow Wilson, when he went to negotiate the Treaty of Versailles after World War I, was the first serving U.S. president to ever leave the United States. It was actually debated in America as to whether this was actually constitutional. Can the American president actually leave his country, uh, even for purposes of diplomacy? Uh, and then, you know, between 1914 and then, of course, they pulled out of the League of Nations. They, well, they didn't join the League of Nations, should I say. The world system collapsed again. And after the, the experience of World War II, America became the creator, if you wish, of an entire, the present multilateral structure that we're talking about. Uh, and there's a cycle of learning, I think, in all of this. Yogesh, you know, one of the key points that we, that the international, the, the, the debates right now in the international system uh, are about the question of a rules-based international law. The Americans are saying that the Chinese are undermining it. The Chinese are saying the Americans are undermining it. All of us claim, every country claims that we support rules-based. But there's a problem because ultimately all countries will infringe the rules every now and then because there's no binding system on the international front. But there's also the question of your own credibility as a nation. And I bring India into this picture. Are you being willing to follow international obligations on the domestic front? And before, I know you will talk to some degree on the economic side, but there is one question here also from a, 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 a Mr. Patel, I think, that uh, you, given what Indian, for example, NGOs and foreign companies have faced in India, 
Uh, how does this stand up to our, our ability to become a major player in the international system? Over to you, Yogesh. Great. Uh, thanks. I think uh, both really great questions um, and uh, pretty complex ones as well. Uh, but just before I answer to those, let me just make one comment about something that uh, Haji mentioned, uh, which is about the focus on climate change and infrastructure development. And, and uh, Haji, the way we have been looking at as corporate lawyers is that the maximum financial institutional investment that India attracts is actually in those areas only where they are respecting climate change and the latest trends. Renewable energy ends up attracting far more capital. Uh, there are obviously the traditional strategic players in the coal businesses and all that, but the true blue financial investors are only putting money there. And we clearly know we are probably short of about $500 billion to get going on our infrastructure story. Uh, so actually, we probably don't even have much of a choice and it all fits in nicely and it is the right thing for India to actually take the mantle on these and lead the charge on these aspects. So I'll, I'll just come to uh, the, the second question, uh, Ramit, that you, you had highlighted about the experience that uh, international organizations have had in India. Uh, look, I think one thing that we'll all agree is that India is a land of contradictions. Uh, we have uh, we have lots of rules. Uh, we are very used to getting advice uh, from our tax advisors that at the lower levels you will actually not win this matter, but maybe at the high court or the supreme court level you get justice. And we people we are used to taking those kind of opinions and accepting them. And that that experience is something that is very relevant because people who come into India need to accept as it is. Uh, we are not the ideal state. But one thing that is very important to highlight to the international community is that in the courts in India, they don't, they are treated the same as any other Indian company. There are hundreds of examples of why there are so many delays in uh, executing uh, court judgments, appeal processes and all that. One of the large, biggest ones which has been a really big blot uh, for a corporate lawyer to explain has been the whole Vodafone judgment, how it went up and down to the Supreme Court and it was, uh, they eventually, uh, uh, the government eventually overturned everything. But what people forget is that within six years, two full rounds of appeal right from the assessment up to the uh, tribunal, up to the high court, up to the Supreme Court were completed as well. Uh, the right set of people can be used, the right focus on the correct interim reliefs, the kind of uh, reliefs that we get are far, far better. And I think those are very important things that Indian businesses understand. And we see that the businesses which have established themselves have been in India actually don't treat themselves as any different. So, yes, it is complex. People need to understand uh, what all uh, issues are being faced. Uh, the government has done a fair bit. There's a nice stack of things they have done regarding what all has been done uh, about ease of doing business in India. But at the end of the day, uh, they still continue to um, face uh, those contradictory issues, the rule of law. We still lack transparency. There is still a lot of red tape, but that applies equally. So people who come in need to take a long view. It's, India is not the place where you bring in hot money and take it out, assuming that you can bet and gamble for six months or two years and get out. You come in, you start gradually, and you stay put uh, for the long, for long periods of time. Uh, so that's just a lawyer's uh, perspective on what we've been seeing organizations. We don't see uh, prejudice. We don't see, and I act for a lot of, the majority of my client base is non indian uh, coming to your first question uh, about India's role and this dichotomy. See, India has got this dualist approach to international law. We uh, go ahead and sign international treaties, but our, our laws require that those treaties need to be adopted by our legislature before it can become binding law. Right Now, uh, their judicial not just activism, I would say creativity has actually managed to address a lot of the gaps. 
so what the courts have managed to do is they've taken views in this case of gramophone company and they took a view that principles of sustainable development polluter pay kind of principles can be adopted in india even if the legislature hasn't provided because they are so well established in international law and india has signed those treaties and there is it is not contrary to any law in india so there's been a lot of creativity also but at the heart of it india has a dualist approach because we have certain constitutional limitations so i would i would i would just very quickly close this to say that uh, there have been uh, there that there is a lot of uh, uh, debate to be had about nationalism acting in self interest we are seeing renouncements and isolation from various countries but i think we got the opportunity where we should be more open and transparent so for example we should be okay for somebody to come in in our supreme court and say we would like to present the international law of side of things we don't need to argue that on a preliminary basis they can't appear in court so that would be of my approach okay thank you uh, we have now out of time we do have a couple more questions but i don't think we really have time to handle i just very quickly look at them Juan asks about the question of vaccine nationalism. Is India ready to handle this? The answer is yes. Uh, India is the world's largest producer of vaccine, seventy percent of all vaccines. So anybody who produces a new vaccine has to come to us. And you look at the top twenty vaccine programs in the world; all of them are the COVID vaccines. All of them have an Indian partner. Somebody's asked about peacekeeping under the UN. I would say the biggest problem we have now in UN peacekeeping is that China wants to take over the entire operation with money. They don't want to provide troops; they just want to provide money. They are now donating more money to the UN Peacekeeping Foundation than all the other P5 members put together. So I'll end on that. Thank you for everybody. This is obviously a session that could have gone on for a couple of weeks, uh, but uh, given the, the sheer complexity of the international structure and the stress that it's under right now. Thank you everybody. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody. Thank you for panelists. Thank you.